Last week I was in Chittagong and while I was coming back from Chittagong University to the city uh, I saw a couple of temples were burned down and little further down the road I saw the windows of a mosque were broken. I did not realize what had happened but the next day as many of you have seen it was on papers the front page on Friday also on Saturday that there was a conflict between Hindus and Muslims in Chittagong and that this big fight and mosques and temples were being broken down. Now consider this situation. The capital market in Bangladesh is in a really bad shape. Inflation rate in our country is more than 11 percent. The index has gone down to 4,000 points. Uh, by, it has reduced by more than 80 percent in the last 14 months and many middle-class families are struggling to have food on the table. Now hold your thought on the capital market for a moment and consider this situation which is more closer to our hearts. I came to this building from Shanti, it took me about 25 minutes on a weekday to commute from Shantinagar to DU would take me an hour whereas the actual distance, the journey should not be for more than 10-15 minutes. Traffic jam is a painful reality that most of us in this city have to live with. These are complex challenges facing our society. How do we move forward? How do we make progress on these challenges? What kind of leadership do we need in society to move the work forward? My name is Ijaz Ahmed and I teach leadership at the Bangladesh Youth Leadership Center and I am here to share with you today the lessons that I've learned and the insights I've developed over the past three years while working with the brightest students of our country from diverse educational, religious and socioeconomic backgrounds and many of our graduates are also in this gathering this evening. The idea of authority and its relationship to leadership. For long, people have confused authority with leadership. People have confused the idea of dominance, the idea of prominence, of influence and power with leadership. And that is your authority over there. That is the authority figure. If this is a social system with different stakeholders, then that is the authority. Right now in this room, if you are, we are all part of a system, you are all stakeholders and I am in the center stage right now, you have authorized me to provide a service. So if I am the authority there, we equate leadership with authority. And whenever we are in a problem, we expect authority to solve our situation. Ivy spoke about motherhood and the wonderful initiative she has taken, taken up to address the issues that mothers uh, come up with. By the time we are a month old, that's when we first develop a relationship with authority. Our mother is the first authority figure. And every time a baby needs something, the baby looks at the mother. So we authorize the mother when you're one month old or two months old. We don't understand love. We authorize the mother. We need something. The mother provides it. So we expect a certain set of services from authority figures. Authorities, whether you're the CEO of a company, your elected representative, president of a club, people expect a certain set of services from authorities. Authorities provide order, direction, and protection. Now, for centuries, the authority structures in society worked very well. Baby has a problem, mother has a solution. That's the end of the case. But in situations where the problems are complex, where authorities do not have the solution, how do we make progress? Leadership is not about authority. Leadership is, a, is at the center. The work at the center, whoever focuses a group's attention to the work at the center and makes progress is exercising leadership. And that is the shift in paradigm that needs to happen. Leadership is not person-centric, it's work-centric. But we live in a glamour-obsessed world. We want our heroes to make us feel good. So we expect authority to solve our problems. Now let's come back to the traffic situation in Dhaka. If the authority had all the solution, who is the authority in Dhaka? In the traffic situation, the authority would be, my guess, would be the Dhaka City Corporation, right? And the mayor of Dhaka. If the mayor of Dhaka, the authority, had all the solution to the problems, then that would be fine. But he's been trying for so long. Why do we still have traffic jam in our city? 
if the solution was broadening the roads, then expert knowledge, our current know-how would be fine to solve the problem. But that's not happening. Perhaps because the problem lies elsewhere. So I work with students from different schools and colleges in Dhaka and Chittagong. So once I had this parent, a mother of one of my students from Vikranesa school. And she came up to me and she said, Ijaz, you teach leadership. Can you please solve this problem for me? I said, what's the problem? And she said, you know, every time I go to Vikram, I said, to pick up my daughter, I'm stuck in traffic. Bailey Road is just so bad. I said, all right. Where do you live? She said, I live in Kakrail. And I said, how do you come to Bailey Road? She said, I take the car. She spends an hour on the car to travel to Bailey Road, where it's just a 10-minute walk. So, if this is a system, if you look at this as the traffic situation in our city, if there are different stakeholders in this system, we have citizens, we have authorities, people who walk, people who use the bus, they're all players in this system. If the system is in a mess, then authority alone cannot solve the problem. Because if the system is in a mess, and if we all are part of the system, then we are also part of the mess. And unless we take ownership of our part of the mess, the situation will not improve. So the work of authority, whoever in this system, if it's someone using the bicycle or the rickshaw or the bus, trying to exercise leadership in this system, what would leadership look like? If anyone can draw attention to the issue at the center, the work at the center, the real challenge, which is changing people's behavior, making adjustments in our lifestyles, if the work moves forward, then that would be an act of leadership. If the nature of the problem is technical, we can solve it with our existing knowledge, then the CEO of a company does not need to exercise leadership. Authority is sufficient. But if the nature of the problem is such that it requires a shift in our mindset, it requires adaptation, it requires innovation, it requires new way of doing things, new way of looking at things, then all the stakeholders in the system must be engaged in the process of leadership. And the opportunity to exercise leadership is available to every single stakeholder in this system. Think about the capital market. Who would be the authority in the capital market system? DSC, CSC, and there's a bad guy who is the governor of Bangladesh Bank. He's not really bad. He was my boss before. Yeah. And then you have the really big guy, the finance minister. So they are all part of authority. Now every time the prices have been going, on, going down, they've been really trying their best. And what have they tried? These are all technical interventions. Putting in more money. Play with the margin that the banks use. Right? But now let's look at the other stakeholders. Now, say, for example, number one, number two. These are small investors in the system. Now, we have learned this in school and college, that if you have $10, don't put all $10 in a risky investment. Diversify your portfolio. Maximum put $5 in a risky investment. But look at the small investors have done. What the small investors have done, not only have they invested their $10, they have borrowed another $10 from the bank at 17% interest and invested $20 with the hope that I will become a millionaire in one year. So the underlying problem in this system is not that the regulations are not working. The real problem is we are too greedy. We don't have the patience. We can't look at the capital market as a long-term investment. I want to make my profits in three months. And look what has happened. So many people have lost so much money. And in the last month alone, we have seen it in the newspapers. This guy committed suicide in Dhaka. He had a wonderful family. And another guy in Chittagong, he committed suicide. That is such a loss to the system. Who will take ownership of this problem? Who will fix this mess? If we all are part of this system, then we must take ownership of our part of the mess. If the system isn't a problem, and I am part of the system, then I have to ask myself, how am I contributing to this mess? But we don't do that. We become numb. 
So we will all walk out of this room at the end of the TED conference and I go home with my car and I meet these two little kids who have no money, no food. And I don't pull my window down because I'm so used to it. I've become numb. That is the status quo. But the fact that I am having a good lifestyle, I am part of this system. And I need to ask myself, how am I contributing to this mess? And that is what I do at BYLC. I teach the next generation of leaders how to distinguish the problems we have in our society. There are two types of problems in the world, and this is the table that I've taken from a book, Leadership on the Li Line, written by Ronald Heifetz and Martin Linsky. Heifetz is the founder of the Center for Public Leadership at Harvard, and he was my professor and supervisor. I worked with him, and Marty was also my professor. So if the problem is technical, then our existing knowledge is sufficient to solve the problem. And authority alone can solve the problem. If the solution to the traffic problem in our city is just that we need to widen the roads we need, and the problem is solved. But if the solution requires all of us to learn new ways of behaving, then we need leadership. We need leadership when a community, when a group, when a society is facing an adaptive challenge that requires us to learn new things. But it's hard. Exercising leadership is hard because I don't want to let go of my comfort. I like my car. So when you're trying to mobilize a group and telling them that you have to change your lifestyle, no one likes it. That's why we elect politicians. I don't like doing the work, so I'm going to give my votes for you and then hold you accountable. You solve my problems. That's why I gave you the vote. And that's what we do with our politicians. Bam, three years, they've done nothing. That's what we do. So if you are an authority, if you are, many of you in this room are, you're, you know, heads of organizations, and if your colleagues, subordinates are listening to you, don't think they love you. People expect a set of services from authority figures. In exchange of that, they give you the attention. The challenge for authority then is not to draw attention to self, but to focus on the work that needs to get done. We also know what happens when leaders, authority figures, don't know what to do with the attention. They draw too much attention to themselves. But the problem is in the middle. The work is in the middle, but the authority has drawn too much attention to himself or herself. And then people take you out of the game. Because people think if they remove you, the work will be done. So people confuse you. People make you the issue. And that's why we have assassinations in leadership. And we have seen that in our subcontinent. People think if they assassinate, take the authority away, the problem will be solved. But the issue still remains. Adaptation is difficult. Because adaptation means we have to change our priorities. We have to change our values. We have to change our habits. And engaging in adaptive leadership is also a risky enterprise because people resist you. And that's why when I was trying to do my own little experiment with leadership, it was extremely difficult. I graduated from Harvard in 2008. I had $120,000 of student loan and I came back with a partner with $10,000. We ran our pilot program in Chittagong. And then I came back to Dhaka. And I had no money. And I had no job. And for the past three years, I've been working from a small room in my father's apartment to set up BYLC to teach leadership to young people. It was not easy. But when people resist you, people close to you resist you, and you think you have a phenomenal idea, but people are not liking it, it's not that they don't get it. They get your idea, but they don't like the loss. So when my father thought I was worthless, it was not that he did not get the idea that something had to change in Bangladesh, but he could not say proudly to his colleagues that my son has got a great degree, and he's making tons of money. And he's got a prestigious job. So that was his loss. He could not show his face to his colleagues. And every time his colleague said, what's your son doing? And he would just be down. Well, you know, he's doing something from home. And my mother could not proudly say to her colleagues that, you know, I've got a son. He's pretty eligible. <laughs> and she was worried for three years that I would never get married. That no man would be crazy enough to let his daughter marry a guy like me, who has no security, no job, and only talks about leadership. <laughs> but then, this woman fell into the trap and came into my non-profit life. But the idea that I am trying to share with you is, why do we need leadership? We need leadership because our existing knowledge is not sufficient to solve all the problems. We need to experiment. For us to thrive, we need to experiment, we need to innovate. And we have heard two speakers talk about innovation. Our first speaker, Dr. Abbani, spoke about innovation. The Niraj spoke, gave a wonderful presentation of innovation. But innovation is also inefficient because innovation has a high failure rate. 
you have to run experiments to innovate. You, you just don't innovate the first time. So we must have that mindset to run experiments. And at BYLC, we are trying to create a more inclusive Bangladesh because leadership for a different Bangladesh has to be inclusive. Leadership has to be collaborative. So we unite students from English medium background, Madrasa background, and Bangla background. We are trying to create a more tolerant young generation so that I may not agree with your worldview, but I should respect it. And you may not agree with my faith, but respect it. We must learn to coexist. So when we talk about a different Bangladesh, the theme of this evening's talk, we talk about a Bangladesh where people from different faith, different orientations, can coexist in peace and harmony. And we respect each other. There are many struggles of leadership and we have heard several stories today how doing something different is difficult. Challenging the status quo is hard because you have to disappoint people. But leadership sometimes involves disappointing people. Disappointing them at a rate they can absorb. For me, leadership has added meaning to my life. When I see our students, some of them in this room, they're running their own initiatives. They're trying to do something for Bangladesh. That gives me hope. When I see our students launching a center and training English medium kids to get into public universities in Bangladesh, that gives me hope. When I see our students from madrasas, Hindu students, Muslim students working hand in hand, that gives me hope. And when I see our students say that leadership is not celebration of self, but about doing the work that needs to get done, that gives me hope. Hope for a different Bangladesh. <laughs>